watching the tale of Holmes Cooney. Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Prior Arguello, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. The early 1980s marked a golden era in boxing below the heavyweight division as fighters like Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns, and Roberto Duran filled the stardom gap left behind by Muhammad Ali. But maybe the greatest action fight of the era matched a man aching for the spotlight, Aaron Pryor, against the class and charm of Nicaraguan mini-media darling Alexis Arguello. The fates were not totally kind to Aaron Pryor. Aaron Pryor was your original bad luck kid. He always had everything against him. He was a bad guy. He could never be the matinee idol. He could never be the good guy. Alexis Aguayo is one of the most gracious people in or out of the ring. He was the embodiment of all the things that I loved about sports. Arguello, the conquistador, the, the, the hero figure. He was an easy guy to root for. Kind of a Spanish Don, a true sportsman. He exemplifies the word champion. Usually in boxing, one of the fighters is portrayed as this gallant figure, and the other is sort of portrayed as Grendel. Aaron Pryor was born the fifth of seven children in a Cincinnati ghetto. He gravitated to a career as violent as his upbringing. I have a very violent family. The impression my mom always gave us, if somebody hit you, you better hit them back. And she used to pop, pop me in here. She said, why you don't move your head when I hit you? I was like, mama, I didn't know I was supposed to move my head. He doesn't really have a lot of guidance as a child. And um, he walks into a gym one day. And here's a, a sport that he's, he's good at, and he gets attention. You know, here's, a, here's a, an older guy, a coach, paying attention to him, which he didn't necessarily have that guidance growing up. I used to be frustrated that nobody in my family came to see me fight. My amateur fights, when I fought in Russia, Poland, Germany, Mexico, um, didn't nobody even know I was gone. I think there was a lot of pain that he was dealing with inside. I think he suppressed a lot of things, and uh, those actions came out when he entered the ring. Fire on the ball of his feet. He beat everybody in the He's one of our top, top amateur fighters of all time. In 76, he won the National Golden Glove Championship in Miami, Florida. Beat the heck out of Tommy Hearns. Fire is your champion! Leading up to the 1976 Olympics, Pryor was marked as America's best bet to win a gold medal in boxing. Aaron, I didn't see it, but I've been told by the guys that were there, Aaron was so, so good in that weight class. Ray moved up. Ray Leonard moved up to get away from Aaron Pryor. But when the famed 76 boxing team arrived in Montreal, Aaron Pryor remained in Cincinnati, reeling from a controversial loss in the Olympic trials. I truly believe that uh, if I'd have made the Olympic team, that I would have been a lot more successful than I was. He was so upset about not making the Olympic Games that he stood in front of a mirror and he hit himself. He hit himself. I saw Sugar Ray Leonard and him. He felt he always belonged in that group and in that class. When he saw them get the big contracts and the money, it broke his heart. Ray Leonard, Howard Davis, and the Spinks brothers, Michael and Leon, won gold medals and signed lucrative television contracts. With no Olympic recognition, Aaron Pryor took a job as a sparring partner for Howard Davis, the man who beat him in the Olympic trials. I was making 500 bucks a week working for Howard Davis. Hey, I beat him up a couple of times, I lost my job. For three years, Aaron Pryor pummeled overmatched opponents. Still, crowds were thin everywhere but his hometown. Cincinnati. I was making a couple of thousand, two, three thousand a fight. Howard Davis and them was making a million, million and a half. Back then, if you weren't made into something special by the networks, then you really weren't anything special. Unable to draw a title shot despite a record of 23 and 0, Pryor moved out of the lightweight division. And only his second fight as a junior welterweight, Pryor faced Antonio Kid Cervantes for the title. In the second round, Cervantes knocked him down. The referee was counting and he was smiling. 
at Cervantes. Oh, now you really want to fight. Then he got up and he just destroyed Cervantes. And from then on, it was all Aaron Pryor. His talent was just tremendous. That was Aaron Pryor. He would take your best punch, spit in your eye, and then kick your ass. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Time is it? Pryor was one of those early inner city fighters who, who came with an entourage of people making noise and threats and, and charging themselves up. And he always had this chorus you know, everywhere he went. Yeah, I got a bunch of guys to me. What time is it? Hulk time! What time is it? Hulk time! His need for love, his need for family, his need for I am somebody was just tremendous. What time is it? Hulk time! What time is it? Hulk time! What time is it? Hulk time. You know, after a while it was all right. We know what time it is. <laughs> But the spectacle surrounding Pryor rarely caught the attention of big-name opponents. A dangerous fighter with meager earning potential, few marquee boxers took the risk of fighting Aaron Pryor. Who do you want to fight next? I want to fight Leonard because I feel like I'm the king of the junior welterweights for what I've already done. A bout with Sugar Ray Leonard offered the surest path to a world-class payday. But Pryor's challenges were repeatedly now, dismissed. I had just been um, asked that you want to challenge me and that you knock me down and I knock you down and... We've had workouts when we were amateur. We actually knocked the guy as a pro and an amateur. What do you know? He knows me. Me and Leonard, you know, I worked with him for flat three or four, before he became Mr. Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> and... There was a little rivalry there, always was. But I know one thing, whenever they'd be in the ring working out, Aaron used to give him a working over. I just beat the number one contender in my weight division. I ain't got nothing to prove there. It's so why show. not come up? This is my show, pal. Go ahead. <laughs> Any other questions, please? <laughs> I want to fight. I want to fight. I beat Tommy Aaron. I Aaron Pryor was being shortchanged by history, if not opponents. He needed a marquee name. Alexis Arguello was a classic boxer, and by that I mean every time you throw a punch, an opening is left. And a great boxer knows what that opening is immediately. Under 30 seconds to go. He was like a bullfighter in there. Oh, big right hand! And that was the art that I loved. By 1981, Alexis Arguello had been crowned champion in three divisions, yet he remained relatively anonymous to the American public. However, no fighter earned greater respect within the boxing community. If there was a person that embodied the whole idea of the sweet science, it was Alexis Arguello. He was the first guy that started going to the opponent and giving the credit they need or they deserve for being in the ring like with a guy like him. He's hurt against him. He's hurt he is this time. There he goes. Arguello's popularity crested when he beat the popular brawler Ray Boom Boom Mancini in 1981. Mancini's ailing father, whose promising fight career was ended by an injury suffered in World War II, was on hand. I love you, father. That's the most beautiful thing you have, like I have my father, and I promise if I can do something for you, let me know, please. Thank you. Five minutes ago, this guy was a raging tornado, crazed dog who had just beaten the crap out of this kid. And now he's got his arm around him and telling him how he loved his father. His father was crying. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about. He won the Hearts of America over. And after that, he became one of America's champions. As Arguello embraced celebrity in America, civil war raged in his homeland. As the Sandinista rebel army attempted a takeover of the Nicaraguan government. For Arguello, returning home was no longer an option. His habit had always been to wrap himself in the Nicaraguan flag, the blue and white, in Madison Square Garden in July of 79 with Bazooka Limon. A Sandinista guy came up and gave him the red and black Sandinista, and he wrapped himself in the Sandinista flag. He would say later that may have been the biggest mistake he ever made in his life, because then the Sandinistas wanted a piece of him. Arguello, at the beginning of that war, uh, he actually supported the Sandinistas. He felt they had blackmailed him. He didn't like their tactics. He didn't like being strong-armed. He didn't like being told what to do by this revolutionary group. And as a result, they took everything he had. 
Arguello became the most famous political exile of the Sandinista occupation. The Sandinistas seized his house, seized all of his assets, evicted his mother. In 79, you know, the revolution had started in Nicaragua and we picked up and left everything that we had. By 1982, after leaving his war-torn homeland, Arguello rebuilt his financial standing and settled with his family in Miami, Florida. A big portion of the community down here had left Cuba had, uh, basically because of similar reasons. So they embraced Arguello for, for taking a stand against the Sandinista government at that time because the Sandinista government had a close link with the Castro government. He was a prototype and a hero to the Cuban community because it was part of the Cuban cause to, to get rid of Castro. So in other words, he symbolized the fight against communism. Arguello's popularity was so immense in South Florida that the Orange Bowl was selected as the site for his fight with Aaron Pryor. You don't beat an Aaron Pryor and you don't beat an Alexis Arguello until you absolutely destroy either fighter. Who's the hungrier fighter, you think? I don't know that at 1.6 and 1.5 million you can say anybody's hungry. Aaron Pryor wants a recognition. Alexis Aguayo is fighting for history. That gives you a heck of an incentive that money can't. Nicaragua in tu suelo. It is a madhouse here. As Arguello comes into the ring with a Nicaraguan flag. And the crowd responds. And I don't think there's any question, Larry, but it is going to be a pro Arguello crowd here. So although he is in exile, he is still a, a great hero in his country. Ray, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that Arguello is not the champion here, but the challenger. The stadium filled in the hope of seeing Arguello claim his fourth title, while Pryor had at last earned a chance to prove himself on the world stage. Says you look at Aaron Pryor, and he is a man intense right now, Ray. I attempted to make Alexis believe that I was going to kill him. What I felt I was going to do to him was for real. You got this guy standing across the ring from you. And he's got this attitude and this aura about him that he doesn't care if he dies. I think he personified in Alexis all the things he could never be. Most importantly, respected. From Manoa, Nicaragua, Mr. Alexis Arguello! Fryer felt slighted. He was introduced in a distinctly different manner than the man trying to take his title. I'm the champion, and you can't say Mr. Pryor, you said Mr. Aguero. You know, I said, man, I'm gonna get you. You can't beat me. You gonna wish you hadn't took this fight. Pryor with the first punch, he scores with the right hand. Up tempo, right from the opening bell. They were throwing bombs from the get-go, and never stopped. Aguero with the right hand, and scores on Pryor, whose legs buckle for a moment. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if someone gets knocked down in the first round. Fire put the pressure on him. I mean, uh, you thought it was a one-round bout instead of a 15-round bout. Well, there weren't too many who expected this fight to go the distance, and at this pace, there is simply no way that it can. Arguello is letting Pryor fight his fight. And another right hand, and Arguello back to the ropes again. That hurt Arguello. Arguello holds on here as Pryor forces the attack. And there was silence. The people that Arguello's fans were just totally in shock. I couldn't even move because I was just watching my dad get his ass beat. He just kept saying, come on, come on, that's nothing. Most boxing experts theorized if Pryor, a two-to-one underdog, had any chance to win, he'd have to knock out Arguello early. Originally, Pryor's handlers wanted it to be a 12-round fight, and my dad wanted it to be a 15-round fight because he knew that if he got Pryor past 10, that it was in the bag for him. After the second round, Pryor's trainer, Panama Lewis, instructed him to drink from a specific bottle. Give me, give me, give me a drink, man, that I mix. One that I mix. A move that would later raise suspicion. Whatever it was mixing, that bottle uh, 
gave Pryor more energy. Pryor again rushing off the stool at Alexis Sarguello. Pryor, who had made short work of most of his opponents, set a frantic pace early in the fight. I don't think I've ever seen Aguayo have to fight so hard, so persistently, in the first few rounds of a fight. Arguello struggled to counter Pryor's relentless attack. As the fight progressed, Arguello began to connect. But he did score with an uppercut with the left hand. Arguello back to the right hand of his own. And then in the middle rounds, he started to make this comeback, and you went, okay, now this is what we're more used to seeing. Maybe the seventh or eighth round started to come around, and my dad started landing more shots. And there's a the right hand, and that might have hurt Pryor. One time he hit me. There's a hard right hand by Arguello. And I thought he knocked my head off. As Arguello closed the gap and the fight drew even, Pryor, the angry brawler, changed his approach. He was expecting me to come in swinging, 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 swinging. I knew I couldn't beat him that way. It's really impressive to see Aaron Pryor as a boxer. You can't find some of the moves in the book he was creating. He was creating in, the, in that fight. You notice the way he bobs and weed throws it with the left hand, the right hand. He's capable of throwing punches from all angles. He was like a Michelangelo. And see, Aguayo can't deal with the boxer. He has trouble with all boxers. And Pryor's doing the right thing now. And Pryor was, was boxing from outside. And Lexus was hitting him, but he was hitting him on the end of the punches, you know. And so therefore, you're sacrificing your power. He never had any reaction but a smile to one of my dad's punches. Every time he got a big punch, he laughed. I said, well, man, this is crazy. Pryor smiles at him off the bow. I have no idea why Aaron Pryor wanted any more of those shots. He just wasn't strong enough to knock me out. This fight had all the billings, of course. Brawler, boxer. Good versus evil. What it all comes down to is two guys in an 18-foot square. A close fight in the eye of any impartial viewer. If the fight had been scheduled for 12 rounds as Pryor's camp had requested, the bout would have ended in scandal. I believe the Spanish official was judging every round for Arguello. And so um, we were kind of getting worried. The worst that could happen is for a fight to go the distance and then somebody has it by one point one way or the other point and then somebody has it 10 points the other way. As you see it now, the fight's dead even. It's just about dead even, yes. This was for real. Aaron you know, Pryor had to knock him out or he would have lost the fight. This is the 13th round. It is still anybody's guess. Having knocked out 29 of 31 opponents, Aaron Pryor had fought past 10 rounds only once in his career. Alexis Arguello had built his reputation in these final championship rounds. That was the best punch of the fight. My head went back and I could see the lights and then still it up there. That was like target practice. I was so concentrated on him that I, that was nothing. I took that shot up. I ate that shot. When Alexis hit a guy with those kind of shots, nine times out of 10, they go down. He fought a different animal and Aaron Pryor. I think Aaron got to a point, he, his mind just went to another place. No matter what, I ain't going nowhere. I'm not gonna get beat today. Two rounds away from the respect Aaron Pryor always thought he deserved. He sat across from a three-time champion and a potential hometown decision. Punch back, win these two last rounds. Six minutes, you can fight for six minutes. Once again, Panama Lewis asked Pryor to drink from the mysterious black bottle. Give me that bottle, that's the one I mix. Pryor brought everything from the inner city and the ghetto with him. Everybody did anything to him that night was with him. That's what Alexis meant to him. Fire on that jab and a combination again. And Arguello's in trouble. Arguello in big trouble against the ropes. Fire going for the kill, trying to put him away. Arguello trying to cover up. A smashing right hand. Arguello's helpless against the ropes. Arguello's hands on the side. It's over. Aaron Fire has retained his junior one-to-one championship. Arguello slips to the canvas. Right. Never seen anything like that before. This time, he reacted by going back to the ropes and allowing me to rush him. I just kept throwing punches, just kept throwing punches. I said, like, they got to not take this fight from me. They're not going to take this fight from me. It was definitely a matter of pride that he wanted to stay up there. No, I'm not going to go down. I'll take 
all your shots, but I'm not going to go down. He never lost his, his, his courage until he slinked back. When I caught him with the overhand right, boom. And the last flurry that ended it by Pryor was as brutal, as ruthless as anything I've ever seen in the ring. The way it looks in, in, in the middle of the ring was like it was hurt bad. I mean, this was not just a knockout, you know, he was hurt. Alexis Arguello felt he had disappointed those close to him. I just remember him coming over to me and hugging me and crying and telling me that he was sorry, and that was it. So many people cry because people love him so much. He just apologized, and I didn't know why, you know. It's like, I was like, Dad, you know, why are you apologizing? You don't have to say sorry. Why apologize to me and to me only? It was just the me that he looked at me in my eyes and he was like, I'm sorry. That was um, an uncomfortable situation. As Aaron Pryor celebrated his greatest victory, a controversy brewed. The newly formed Miami Boxing Commission had neglected to collect urine samples after the bout. The local commission is in charge of the test, and so the local commission really blew it. The absence of a post-fight drug test focused national attention on a transaction occurring in Pryor's corner shortly before the final round. Move it out of battle. You're not the one I mix. Trainer Panama Lewis, as he had also done after the second round, requested a specific bottle, one that he mixed. Boxing rules permit only the usage of water in the corner. We saw the tape where, where, where Panama was furious and asking for the other bottle, not the water, the one that I mixed. Uh, I don't think you mix water with water. The media had already, you know, made me the feeling. I don't doubt that there was some sort of stimulant in that bottle. I really don't, in retrospect. Someone had said sh it was, schnapps was in it. It was used to control diarrhea. And he didn't need a bottle to get through that. I think that was a way of Panama injecting himself into a very pivotal part of that fight. Well, Aaron Pryor just came on strong. I don't know why, where he got the energy from. But one thing I do know, and I'm sure the boxing fans know, that Aaron Pryor didn't need that bottle, whatever it was. My pride is what is involved in the rematch with Alexis. While Arguello never contested Pryor's victory, the black bottle fueled demand for a rematch. He came up and asked me, did I have anything in the black bottle? This is why I took the second fight with him and um, why I told him apart. In the most anticipated rematch since the thriller in Manila between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, Alexis Arguello and Aaron Pryor will again go to war. Second fight, he didn't have the black bottle. Knocked him out in 10 instead of 14. Beat him up worse. Here goes Pryor again. Oh, what an uppercut to the chin of Arguello. Arguello's in trouble. He's down. He's down on his right knee and in hand. He goes to the seat of his pal. He knew what was going to happen if he had, if he had gotten up. He wasn't out. He wasn't out on his feet. But he knew. He got me again. I just can't beat this guy. And he let himself get counted out. That's it. And you're all over. It's all over. Aaron and he said, Jimmy, in all my years of boxing, he says, I've never been hit with two hands at the same time. He was just like in awe of pride. I was pushing really hard and uh, I was really hurt. You know, I don't want to risk my, my life, you know. We know what we wanted to do after this fight and we know what we had to do during this fight. Alexis wanted to go home a four-time world champion and I wanted to go home with my title. Fighters kind of reveal themselves like this is what I'm about, let's see what you're about. There's a tremendous amount of respect because both of them spent probably everything they had. It was a lot like the thrill in Manila. Just in a sense that it was two warriors, I mean, just laying it out from the beginning to the end. And I don't think there's any question that had lifelong lasting results. I mean, neither fighter was ever the same after that. Three years after the black bottle controversy, Panama Lewis was banned from boxing for illegally stripping padding from the gloves of a fighter. Aaron Pryor, his career foreshortened by cocaine addiction, retired with a what might have been record of 39 wins against a single loss. And Alexis Arguello, who later also battled cocaine, eventually returned home to Nicaragua. Thanks for watching The Tale of Pryor Arguello.